I want to introduce our first speaker who's going to start this process, and um, it's someone that I have so much respect for, as well as being in, uh, trained in Harvard and NYU. Um, Dr. Leo Gallant is also a recipient of the Linus Pauling Award, and Linus Pauling holds an amazing honor in that he's the only person to win a Nobel Prize in two different disciplines, and uh, that was for formulating some of the key concepts of functional medicine, um, Dr. Leo Gallant, and uh, his talk is perfectly apt for starting this. I think what you'll see hopefully is a congruent story told over the, the day, uh, over the evening, and uh, Dr. Gallant is going to kick us off with his talk entitled Planet U. Thank you, James. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. Nothing has had as profound effect on the evolution of medicine in the past as the discovery of microbes and the recognition that they're not just passive bystanders, that they contribute to human disease and are important for healing. Now, it took about 200 years from the dis first discovery of microbes until that recognition took place, and it's taken over 100 years for the role, the beneficial role of microbes in healing to really begin to get the attention that it deserves. I believe that research into the human microbiome, which is the mass of microbes normally living in the body, is not only going to transform the practice of medicine in the future, but it will also change the way that we view our relationship to our environments and even our concept of what it means to be human. Now that's a very big promise but it is grounded in science, and I want to take you on a journey to this critically important scientific frontier. Here's your body. It is really there, it's not imaginary, and it does change all the time. There are 10 trillion cells that contain your own DNA. Every surface, inside and out, is covered with an invisible blanket of microbes. Most of them are bacteria, and most of them are found in your large intestine, deep within your core. The effects of this microbiome on your body are profound. There are 100 trillion organisms, 10 times more microbial cells than there are human cells in your body, on their own, they form a biomass that is the same size and weight as your brain. Your body is actually a series of interconnected, interdependent ecosystems. And very much like planet Earth is a series of interconnected, interdependent ecosystems. I call this concept Planet U, and it's been my mission to help doctors and patients understand it and utilize it for healing and for the prevention of illness for about 35 years, long before the term microbiome was even coined. There are about a thousand species of microbes that, comp that comprise the microbiome for any individual and they're organized into highly structured living communities, which vary from place to place in your body. So what's growing in your nose is different from grow is what's growing in your mouth. It changes and evolves over time in a fashion that's somewhat predictable. As an infant, you had a microbiome that is different than the one that you have now as an adult, and in old age, it'll be different still. Illness and medication influence it, and so does pregnancy. Those of you who have, been, who have been pregnant had a change in your microbiome at the time of pregnancy that encouraged weight gain and support for a healthy outcome of pregnancy. The 
changes that occur in the microbiome are not only predictable, they are unique and specific for each individual. So you are basically walking around and you have a cloud of microbes that follows you everywhere and it's your own individual cloud, kind of like a fingerprint. In fact, they're looking into um, analyzing microbiome signatures as an aid to law enforcement. And I'm pretty sure at some point soon you're going to see it on CSI. <laughs> I discovered the microbiome in my clinical practice. I have seen so many patients whose health changed permanently or long term, underwent long term change following an event that was likely to have affected the microbes in their gut. Often the triggers were drugs, antibiotics, um, and acid suppressing drugs in particular um, can really wreak havoc with the gut um, microbiome communities. Antibiotics as part of the collateral damage that they um, impact not only can wipe out beneficial communities, but can encourage the growth or overgrowth of undesirable organisms that interfere with health. The acid suppressing drugs that are so widely used for the treatment of conditions like heartburn um, or abdominal pain have a much subtler effect on the microbiome. Stomach acid plays a really critical role in maintaining the ecosystem of the upper GI tract. It kills microbes that enter the stomach from the mouth or from food. And suppressing stomach acid allows an overgrowth of organisms and it allows an increase in foodborne infection. The effects of antibiotics or of acid suppressors like the proton pump inhibitors can be likened to the effects of environmental pollution creating climate change. It, it can be very subtle, but it can be devastating. Now, acute infections are a little bit more like having an asteroid strike. It stirs up a, crowd of, a cloud of dust. And I, have seen a lot of people whose health changed permanently after a parasitic infection, for example. Now what happens with acute infections is that inflammation occurs, and inflammation alters the microbiome. And here's where the understanding of microbes as active participants in our health is really important. Inflammation encourages the growth of certain species of microbes that thrive in an inflammatory milieu. In inflammation, a lot of nitrates are formed, and there are organisms that thrive in this nitrate-rich environment. They happen to be pro-inflammatory organisms. In other words, inflammation encourages their growth, and they send out signals that create more inflammation, which then allows them to continue to grow. This is a vicious cycle, and it's called by the name dysbiosis. Now, the kinds of conditions that I found to flow from dysbiosis were mostly inflammatory disorders, which are pretty rampant in today's world. Uh, they included gastrointestinal disturbances, of course, but also allergic illness and autoimmune diseases. Most interesting were the effects on the brain. And so I saw many patients in whom this kind of inflammatory dysbiosis provoked depression, anxiety, fatigue, cognitive dysfunction, in children disorders like attention deficit or even autism. Helping to restore a healthy gut bacterial flora in these patients often really improve their health. And I call this process reflorestation. 
Now, when I first started writing and lecturing about dysbiosis and reflorestation back in the 1980s, my concepts were considered pretty avant-garde. Recently, mainstream medicine has actually come to embrace those concepts. And terms like leaky gut, dysbiosis, uh, and even reflorestation are widely used in medical journals these days. Researchers looking at the impact of gut microbes on health are finding links to diabetes, heart disease, obesity, and the obesity link is really fun driving funding for a lot of the research because the goal there is to find some microbial solution to a very complex problem, as well as the epidemic of autoimmune and allergic disorders of which my patients have been part. Now, I'd like to get back to the brain. I've recently completed a review article called The Gut Microbiome in the Brain for a new journal that is going to premiere this fall called Brain and Gut. Uh, and uh, in that article, I focus mostly on studies in humans. But the story really starts with laboratory animals that have no microbiome. They're called germ-free. And the research that's been done on the behavioral effects of being germ-free are really eye-opening and, strangely enough, very relevant to humans, as I'm going to describe to you. Germ-free rats and mice are born and raised under totally sterile conditions. They have no bacteria in or on their bodies. And the first fascinating observation about germ-free animals is they require really intense nutrition in order to grow and look normal. They can't survive on ordinary laboratory chow. The reason is that your microbiome is feeding you. It's supplying some nutrients by producing them, and it's helping you digest and absorb other nutrients. That recognition led to the look for a link between obesity and the microbiome. Now, the second really important finding was that there are very few chemicals circulating in the blood of germ-free animals compared to conventional laboratory animals. 99% of the chemicals that are circulating in your blood right now derive from the microbes in your body, not from your own cells. Of course, the immune systems of germ-free animals are fairly lazy and not very well developed. That's not surprising because the best known effect of the microbes are to tune up your, your immune system. But it's the behavioral effects that are really fascinating. And in response to stress, germ-free animals have a much greater adrenal response than conventional animals. And this is true for both rats and mice. But the behavioral response of rats and mice who are germ-free is totally opposite. And in order to study this, what the um, scientists do is they create, uh, they have a cage, still sterile, that's open. And they put the animals in it, and they watch how they explore the space. Well, um, germ-free mice are much more adventurous than conventional mice, whereas germ-free rats are timid and kind of hide in the corners. Now, think about what that means. I mean, humans have been living with rats and mice for about 10,000 years, since, at least since we invented agriculture. And we get to know them pretty well, and our language includes terms that describe what we know about their behavior. So we may say, someone's timid as a mouse, never timid as a rat. And <laughs> you're a rat has a totally different connotation than you're a mouse. Okay. So timidity which is a behavior characteristic of mice, and aggressiveness, which is a behavior characteristic of rats, 
both require a microbiome for their characteristic expression. And when there isn't one, rats are a little, behave a little bit more like mice, and mice behave a little bit more like rats. This is not a trivial um, distinction, because the ability of these animals to survive in the wild requires the ability to balance caution with exploration. They need to be able to search for food but avoid predators. And so the patterns that they develop and the way they develop them is going to determine how well that species survives. Now, does this have anything to do with humans? In fact, the research indicates that it does. French researchers took a bunch of human adults and administered a probiotic containing lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, very specific strains, for 30 days. At the end of 30 days, and, and they used a double-blind, placebo control randomized design, which is the most exacting protocol for clinical research. At the end of 30 days, those people who had been getting the probiotics showed a significant reduction in multiple measures of anxiety and in their adrenal stress responses. And interestingly, they showed an improvement in problem solving. Now, problem solving is a behavior that we consider to be characteristically human. And I venture to say that the survival of our species is going to very much depend on our problem solving. Researchers in um, California did a similar study with a different combination of probiotics. And they did this with women, and they looked at the, they did MRIs of their brain, functional MRIs, and they found that the probiotic was associated with an improvement, with changes in brain function that related to anxiety and connectivity. Now, as different as we may be from rats and mice, and as different as our consciousness is, it really appears as if our behavior and our responses to stress may be as much influenced by the microbes living in our bodies as is the case for rats and mice. And I think there's a strong argument for the co-evolution of microbes with humans in producing this change. So we are humans, yes, but we are really ecological systems. And the real importance of this in, for the future of medicine is not so much in reductionist approaches and individual products that are used, but in the recognition that it may be possible to treat people and to treat illness by addressing the ecology of the human being rather than just attempting to suppress the disease. This has been a goal of mine for the past 35 years, and I believe that its realization has come much closer. Thank you for your attention.